Hi, this is Craig, and welcome to another edition of Cruising Off Duty. So the previous episodes you saw how we bought our boat, how we shipped our boat, and how we got it ready for the first season. Before I go any further with all the other footage I have, I wanted to just talk about the benefits of having a cruising sailboat, or what I call a floating cottage, versus an actual cottage. And then I'll take you on a tour of Off Duty and show you why this is uh, an excellent boat to make a cottage out of. All right, first of all, what makes a floating cottage better than an actual cottage? So I've written, written some things down on my iPhone so I couldn't uh, possibly forget some of these points because there's a bunch of them. Pros of a cruising sailboat or a floating cottage is it's less expensive than an actual cottage. So as you know from the previous episode, we paid $60,000 for this boat. And I know looking at the cottages on the Ottawa River at least, and I'm sure there's more expensive places than Ottawa, buying any property on an actual body of water is extremely expensive. I don't even think I could get the land on the river for $60,000, let alone an actual cottage on it. So pretty clearly a boat is cheaper than a cottage, especially a used boat. And that's one thing I would highly suggest. Uh, you don't wanna lose money on your floating cottage, probably not a good idea to buy a brand new boat because just like a car, the minute you drive it off the lot, or in a boat's case, the minute you sail it away from the brokerage, you're losing money because the depreciation is pretty steep in those first three years. Good thing about a boat versus a, a car is a boat's made of fiberglass, and fiberglass doesn't rust. So boats will last 40, 50 years before the fiberglass is in such bad shape you can't uh, patch it up. So that's, that's good. I mean, boats last a long time, and uh, the depreciation generally is in those first, let's say 10 years. This is a 1994 boat and we bought it six years ago. So we bought it in 2010. So it was already a 14 year old boat when we got it. So if we sell our boat 10 years after we bought it, we'll probably end up selling it for about the same price as we bought it for. So we won't lose anything, but we won't gain anything. No land taxes. So on a cottage, one of these waterfront properties, I'm sure they're paying at least well, I pay $5,000 tax on my house in Ottawa, so I'm sure uh, a waterfront property, even not a great one, even a some, somewhat run-down one, is probably paying close to $10,000 in taxes a year. And we don't pay any tax on a boat. We, we pay to be part of the Nepean Sailing Club. We pay about $2,100 a year for uh, slip, our slip and everything that goes along with it. And uh, we think that's a deal because the club gives you a lot of stuff included. It's a very social club. There's a lot of activities there that are done by the club that we're part of. We have a huge circle of friends in the sailing community, mostly because of the club. I'm sure if we were just sailing on our own out of, uh, you know, some guys anchored in front of some guy's house, we wouldn't have nearly the circle of friends that we have being part of the club. The club supplies you with water for free. There is a plug-in. Now each slip doesn't have its own power like they do at Britannia, but there is plug-in if you need it uh, at the service docks and even some of the docks along W dock have a uh, plug-in. So if you uh, accidentally leave something on and your batteries are dead, you can plug in and that's all included. Uh, pump out is all included. So your uh, septic tank that needs to be pumped out after you've been up river for a few days, that's included. So there's a lot that is included for $2,000 and $2,000 is substantially less than $10,000 that the land taxes would be on a uh, cottage. Uh, we, we have no, well, I kind of talked about this, we have no water bill, no sewer bill, no hydro bill, and no gas for heat bill on a boat like you would for a cottage. For the cottage, you need to have all that stuff hooked up. All those bills add up. I know with my house, it's crazy how much all my water, sewer, hydro, and gas bills are, even if we're barely ever at the house. A boat, a floating cottage, is less maintenance than a real cottage. I have friends who have real cottages and Half the time spent at the cottage is mowing grass, repainting things that need to be repainted, shingles need to be repaired every once in a while. And a lot of my friends who have cottages feel like most of the time at the cottage is actually just keeping the cottage maintained. And that's not so with a boat. Oh, this one's the big one. You can have a different view every single time you use your boat. You're not stuck in one spot. A cottage, like this brown one over here, which I'll point to after, um, they have one view of the water and they don't have a 360 degree view of the water like we do. I can look in any direction and see water. They have one view at the front of their cottage of the water and that's the same view they get every single time they come to the cottage. And I will be at Crystal Bay one day and then Pinney's one day and Constance Bay another day and who knows where after that. And every time I anchor, even if I'm in the same anchorage, I don't anchor in the exact same spot, I get a different view. 
and it's a 360 degree view. So definitely the view from a boat is more varied and it's probably better because every direction you look is a beautiful view. This is a big one. If you don't like your neighbors, it's easy to pull anchor and just move. If you've got a cottage and the people next door decide they're gonna have a summer party and start blaring music and, and laughing and screaming and you wanna just have a quiet, relaxing day to read a book, you're just screwed because you can't move and you just have to put up with it. Here, and we've had this, uh, I'll probably put that in one of our episodes, we anchored here at Pinney's and that cottage over there, the Brown Cottage, had a huge party with a bunch of teenagers blaring rap music and other stuff and Janice hates that music. I mean, I, I could have lived with it, but she hated it and she just said, let's move. So we upped anchor and went down to uh, Baskins Beach, which is another anchorage just up the river and it was peaceful and beautiful there. So. If you have a cottage and you don't like your neighbors or your neighbors party all the time and you don't like it not much you can do yeah this is this was one that we will be discussing in future episodes if you don't like the body of water you're floating on you, you can move your boat so we've been on this river the Ottawa River for six years and it's landlocked I'll, I'll be doing a drone video of the rapids down by Britannia and then also of the Fitzroy Dam and because of those two obstructions we're stuck in this body of water. It's 22 miles, 22 miles long and you know it's it's great. It's it's awesome. It's close to where we live. That's the big selling feature. We live in Kanata and from Kanata to the Nepean Sailing Club is like a 10 minute drive. So we're at a boat. I can come to the boat after work. I can come to the boat if I just forget some tools I need on the boat. I can just slide over and get them. If I had a cottage, most times I can't afford a cottage right on the Ottawa River, right in a big city. So you've got to be an hour and a half, two hours away on some little lake somewhere. So if you drive home and realize you forgot something you really need at the cottage, you got a long drive to get back there. But the downside to being on one body of water, and you would have this with a cottage too, is uh, if you get sick of the body of water, what are you going to do with your cottage? You're going to have to sell it, right? And then you got lawyer fees and real estate fees, land transfer, taxes all this stuff and then you got to buy another cottage in another body of water and maybe five years from now you'll get sick of that one too. With a boat you've got that option even with a big boat like this where I obviously couldn't pull it myself as you saw from the previous episode I'd pay a truck to uh, a truck to move it but if I decide I want to go from here to the Great Lakes it's probably going to cost me a thousand dollars and I'll move my boat there and join a new club down there and I'm good to go. I'm spending, and on the Great Lakes you probably never get bored of it because it's so many bodies of water that you can go forever and obviously you even have the opportunity to go to the ocean. You can go down, down the St. Lawrence or down the Erie Canal system and get to uh, the east coast of the United States and from there you can go anywhere you want. That is what Janice and I are planning to do in the future. We're not sure how soon, whether it's next season or the season after that, but at some point we'll be at the point where we've been at every anchorage on the Ottawa River and it's kind of becoming the same old same old. My argument for staying is we have such a good circle of friends here and the social atmosphere is great. If we move our boat two hours away to Kingston, two and a half hours away maybe, uh, now it's we're probably not going to go to the boat as much. We're not going to pop over after work for a, a quick dinner out in Crystal Bay like we do now. We're just never going to do that. The only time we're going to go to our boat is if we have at least a weekend, a two-day weekend and maybe even better to always try and get a three-day weekend, which means leaving right after work on Friday and coming back late, 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 late Sunday night. And so uh, we'll probably use the boat less. But the upside is when we have vacation, the water's unlimited, right? You've got, you got a million places you can go. So you'll probably never need to go to the same anchorage twice. If you go somewhere and it's only okay, just don't go back again. So simple. So we'll be probably doing that. It's just that whole balancing act of do you want to be close to your boat and use it all the time, but be on the same body of water you've been on a ton? or do you want to be further away but have a waterway that you'll never be bored of? So, tough decision that we have to make in the, in the future. Okay, so I've talked about all the pros of a floating cottage and I'm sure people that own a cottage cottage are probably pretty upset with me because I'm not saying anything beneficial about cottages. The only thing I can think of that might be beneficial to a cottage is if you buy a cottage and you own it long enough, chances are when you sell it, you'll sell it for more than you bought it for. That's got a caveat that you didn't buy it in a boom time. If you buy it in a boom time, it may be a long time before you ever get back to the price you paid. The best thing, obviously, if you could time it, is buy a cottage in the recession and hopefully down the road when you decide you're bored with it and want to sell it, you're, you're selling in a boom time and then you will make money. On a boat, you know, like I say, if you buy a boat that's 10 years old or, or older, you probably most of the depreciation is out of the boat 
and therefore when you sell it hopefully you can sell it for about what you paid for it if you've kept it in good shape if you've maintained it and upgraded things as they slowly break um, chances are you'll sell it for about what you paid for it um, worst case scenario you, you lose a bit like if you bought it for 60 and sold it for 50 but you got 15 years of use out of it I don't really find that too bad but that's the trick buy a boat that's at least 10 years old if you buy a brand new boat go to the Annapolis boat show and see these sweet boats that are there for $250,000 and you own it for five years and then you turn around and try and sell it you are not going to get $250,000 for a five-year-old used boat so keep that in mind I always would go with a used boat even with our next boat that's something we'll talk about in a future episode we're planning to keep this until we retire and then we're gonna sell this boat and buy a catamaran because our intention is to live on the boat we're gonna sell everything houses cars motorcycles the whole works and we're gonna buy a catamaran and we're intending to sail around the world knock on fiberglass that we're in good health uh, about it's gonna be about six and a half seven years from now but if we're in good health that's the plan and uh, so that's that's where we're going from here but uh, when we sell this boat if we lose a little bit of money and but we've got 15 years of use out of it I, I won't be uh, I won't be upset so anyway that's what it is what I want to do now is show you what makes off-duty a cruising sailboat and why it's got all the amenities that I consider it a floating cottage all right we'll start at this, this the stern of the boat here there's that thing that was making all the noise in the background my dinghy but that really is your car and if you live on a boat that's going to be your the family vehicle that gets you from here to shore and in this case that dock over there at Penny's Point and if you want to go walking or at some of the places there are stores on the shore and you can just walk to a store if you need to go pick up milk or bread or eggs oh there's Doug <laughs> bringing his bouncy house you taking it to shore uh, I gotta fold it up. Ah, yeah, it's easier to do it there, right? Figure out how to do that in the water. <laughs> Anyways, back to the uh, back to the tour. Like I say, lots of friends when you're part of the sailing community. You tend to know almost everybody after you've been here a few years. Okay, back to the tour. Okay, so on the back of the boat is a swim platform, and actually you can see the name of the boat off duty. The original name of the boat was Flashbulb we hated so we uh, got rid of that as soon as we could next thing is the uh, steering wheel in the console with the electronics wind direction depth of water speed of boat uh, electronic compass autopilot autopilot's the most important thing here because with the autopilot it allows me to easily sail by myself I just set the boat on a heading I want to stay on and I can go and work on the winches change the sails go down below get a drink whatever I got to do now here's the most important thing that makes this a floating cottage. Up here on my Bimini, I've installed a 260 watts of solar, two 130 watt panels. And it goes to a controller, which then goes into my three house batteries and one start battery. And it runs everything. I, can, I have an inverter that runs everything that would be a 110 volt, like my laptop or anything else that needs to charge with a regular house plug. My inverter does that. so. Like I say, floating cottage, because I have all the amenities that I would have if I had a regular cottage with plug-in. The rest of the boat is pretty, pretty standard. Uh, I've got in-mast furling main and a furling genoa up at the front there, the green thing. Uh, this black thing is just a, a bug net that we can throw over the companionway. At night, you, can, you want the airflow for cooling, but you don't want the bugs coming in. And that's pretty much it. The boat is 35 feet long and 12 feet wide. So it's a very beamy boat. And now I'm gonna take you down into the boat itself. Starting at the back, we have our uh, galley, three, three burner stove, oven that we've never ever used because we use our barbecue outside. Double sink, pressure water. There's a pump, uh, you turn on the pump for pressure water and you have pressure water and you also have a foot pump for river water. So if you just want to rinse something off, you can use river water to get the food off and then wash it with clean water. That solar panel I showed you runs the house bank of batteries, which means this fridge runs 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So all your food's already on board when you come to the boat. You got your beer, your pop, whatever else you want. This is the, I guess the master bedroom. It's a queen size bed. Uh, I sleep here all the time. Janice sleeps here if we have guests. Otherwise she sleeps in the V-berth 
only because there's more space and we don't wake each other up getting in and out of the bed. The head is here. The head has a toilet sink and the sink handle goes up here to the spot where it's held for a shower. So you turn your sink tap into your shower tap. When the engine's running, or if you were plugged into shore power, there's a hot water tank under here that the engine heat heats up the water tank and therefore when you're done getting to Anchorage, you have hot water for shower. So that's our, I guess you'd call it our couch, kitchen seating area here. I also do all my editing if I'm doing work on the boat here. As you can see, my laptop's plugged in to that inverter we already mentioned. And this is the V-Berth, which is just used for storage right now. Janice sleeps in here. We would take obviously the floaty chairs out so she has more space. I'm six feet tall. I just want to let you know that so I, I don't have to bend down to be in here. After seeing all the amenities that Off-Duty has, I hope you agree with me that uh, it is a floating cottage and a floating cottage has more benefits than an actual cottage. If you've enjoyed this episode, please click like. And if you'd like to see more episodes of Cruising Off-Duty, please subscribe. Thanks a lot.